Welcome to Best Paper Session 1. A quick question as we get started. Uh, we are awaiting one member of our Best Paper Committee. If you are already in the room and have not yet received your rubric from your Best Paper Committee Chair, there we go, Beth. <laughs> All right, thanks. Okay. Hi, I'm Maureen Holbert from Booz Allen Hamilton. I'm a member of the Knowledge Management Subcommittee for ITSEC, and I'll be the chair of this session today. The deputy is Sandra Chambers, who greeted you as you entered into the room. She's from General Dynamics Mission Systems. We thank you for attending and do ask that because of the nature of the theater, if you could pull your chairs in. If people arrive late in the session, it's kind of hard to squish past these little rows. So please make room for those late arrivals. We'll be hearing from three papers during our session today. A few items to review before we begin. First, as a courtesy to our presenters, please turn off or silence your cell phones. If you do take pictures during the session, please no flash, and we do not allow recording of the presentation, so please do not turn on the video feature. Each paper will have 20 minutes to present, followed by a five-minute Q&A period, and then a five-minute transition period as folks come and go between the first, second, or third papers. If you need to leave the room before the presentation is over, exit through the doors at the side of the room through which you entered. And as a reminder, all registrants are eligible to receive CEU credits for all paper presentations, so please ensure you're scanned into each paper presentation before it begins. Our first paper is Developing the Human-Machine Teaming Ecosystem. Our presenters, Dr. Stacy McAllister and Dan Javorsek, Stacy is a Technical Director of Autonomy and Artificial Intelligence for General Atomics Aeronautical Systems. Her work focuses on prototyping novel machine learning algorithms, developing machine learning algorithms using sparse, heterogeneous, or imbalanced data sets, and exploratory data analytics. She holds a bachelor's degree from Iowa State University in Mechanical Engineering and a master's and PhD from ISU in Mechanical Engineering and Human-Computer Interaction. Jan Dvorsek is the commander of Detachment 6, Air Force Operational Test and Evaluation Center at Nellis Air Force Base, Nevada, and the director, F-35 United Operational Test Team. Afotex Detachment 6 plans, conducts, and reports on realistic, objective, and impartial operational test and evaluation of fighter aircraft. The detachment evaluates the operational effectiveness, suitability, and mission capability of the A-10 F-16, F-15 CEEX, F-22 F-35, and Next Generation Air Dominance aircraft, and reports results in support of major acquisition program milestone decisions and combatant command fielding decisions. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to present Dr. McAllister and Dr. Dan Javorsek. Stacey and Dan. Thanks, Maureen. Uh, so today we're here to present on our paper, Developing the Human Machine Ecosystem. I'm Stacy, and that's Animal, and I'll be your first presenter today. So we're gonna start off introducing the problem, explaining what is the human machine teaming ecosystem and why is it relevant. Then we'll move into explaining the technology behind this ecosystem. We'll go into effective policy standards and management practices for what we need to do to actually make this ecosystem a reality, and then we'll conclude with some kind of take home points and then also talk about future work that we need to continue developing to make sure we can realize this vision. So to start, let's talk about AI and machine learning. This has become a huge buzzword in the DOD and both in industry and the DOD and we're all very interested in kind of seeing what this emerging technology can do for our warfighter. Specifically, one of the use cases we talk a lot about is the air-to-air -air use case. So we're talking a lot about how can we use autonomous wingmen to augment today's fighter pilots. And a lot of the times, however, we get really enamored with what the technology can do. We don't necessarily think about all of the facilitating infrastructure and kind of underlying themes that we need to develop to actually make that end vision a reality. And so what we're going to do today is talk through if we want that human machine teaming ecosystem with that autonomous wingman to pair with the pilot, what are some of the pieces of technology we need to deliver, and then what policy standards and management practices do we need to develop to actually envision, make that technology vision a reality. And so that brings us to our two research questions that we aim to address with this paper. 
The first one is more technology-based, so we're going to touch on all the different pieces that need to exist within this ecosystem uh, to bring about that vision. And then we're going to talk about the PSMA challenges, because a lot of times the technology isn't the challenge. It's getting our organizations aligned to bring about this technology. And so that's something that we really wanted to discuss to kind of help make um, the, the technology possible. So to start with, let's talk about the tech. What does this ecosystem look like as a whole? So it's going to start with data. Data is going to be a very, very important aspect of this. We're going to collect data from a lot of different places so we can actuate the different pieces in the ecosystem. And so the pieces within that ecosystem are going to need to be very vendor agnostic because we're going to need to plug and play different pieces of technology as it matures and evolves because not all of this is ready yet. In order to do that, we're going to need a very heavy focus on well-defined interfaces and standards because we need to be able to move data between pieces and without that interoperability, things are going to get siloed. Once we actually build out the technology in the puzzle, we can then move that technology into the deployed platforms. The deployed platforms are going to be unmanned aerial vehicles. They'll also be live virtual constructive training exercises so we can kind of prototype and learn with this technology. And then also there's going to be a manned side of the equation as well. There may be artificial intelligence deployed on there or we need that human machine teaming interface so those manned assets can control the UAVs. But really what it comes down to in order to put all of these pieces together is we need those well-defined interfaces to make sure everybody can play nice in the same sandbox. So now let's do a little bit of a deeper dive into each of those pieces. So the first is data. Data is going to be the key underpinning layer of this whole ecosystem. Data is going to drive the autonomy. It's going to provide the human operator with the situational awareness that they need to make decisions. This data is going to come from a multitude of different sources, different sensors on the aircraft, off the aircraft, and from other sources of intelligence. As a result, we need to treat data as a weapon in this ecosystem because of its importance. It's not just kind of an auxiliary asset, it is the point. And so in order, like I said, to get the data between all of these different pieces, we need connectivity and data standards. We need to be able to move the data from different sensors to different platforms and also make sure that we can do that through open translation layers and open standards. Without this, things are going to become siloed and the autonomy and the humans won't have the actionable information that they need to make decisions and operate in a pretty complex battle space. Now let's talk a little bit about compute hardware. So compute hardware we have to think about in kind of two separate ways. The first one is going to be the on-the-ground compute hardware. So the compute hardware on the ground is going to be your big traditional server farms. You're going to do a lot of number crunching. You're going to have a lot of power, a lot of GPUs to kind of run all your experiments and your simulations to train and develop your models. But then we also have to think about what happens when we want to deploy these algorithms. And that's going to be in the air. And so in the air, we're going to be what we call size, weight, and power constrained, or swap constrained. And so we need to figure out how can we get these models, these algorithms that we trained in these large server farms, if you will, into this smaller edge deployed form factor. And so coming up with tools and ways to shrink those models down, being able to quantify different performance trade-offs when we move to the edge is going to be very, very important so we can increase the performance of these algorithms so that way they translate from the lab to actual operation. Now let's talk about deployment infrastructure. That's also going to be a very important facilitating piece of this ecosystem. So the deployment infrastructure aspect deals with how do we actually get these models to the warfighter. It's not just the cool technology. It's developing the training. It's developing the infrastructure for someone who's an 18-year-old just out of basic training to be able to gather that data, monitor these models, and re-release them to the aircraft. If we don't necessarily build out that facilitating infrastructure, we're not going to be able to get this capability to the warfighter. Next up, let's talk about simulation. So simulation is going to be incredibly important for both the autonomy and also the human operators. Simulation is going to be where both the autonomy and the operators get their reps and sets in. And it's important to be able to do this in simulation because often we don't have the time, the resources, or the money to be able to do this repeatedly in the real world. 
Using simulation for autonomy, what we can do is allow it to train in various edge cases and in ways that would be cost prohibitive or too dangerous in the real world. And what this allows us to do is train the autonomy so that way it matches when we deploy it into the real world much, much better than if we operated on smaller data sets. And also for the humans, it's gonna be important so that way they can co-evolve their tactics along with the autonomy as it's developed. We wanna make sure that our operators have the ability to test out, kick the tires, so to speak, on this capability while it's being developed so that way when they get into battle, they can hit the I believe button and actually trust that it's gonna do what they believe it's gonna do because they've used it in simulation a number of times. And lastly, the human-machine interface. So this is a, a piece of the system that is gonna be the mesh between the human and the machine. And so when we're building out these human-machine interfaces, we need to think about how to show the operator's context and make them understand what the machine is gonna be doing next, right? We want the machine and the human to share a common mental model of the battle space so they can be operating on the same picture so that way they operate more as a team uh, rather than two independent units, and that will um, help us really make sure that we can execute that vision of human machine teaming to its full extent. So thank you, Stacy. Um, oftentimes I like to talk about uh, trust as being the currency of combat operations, the way that we actually operate. And when it comes down to going into combat, I think it's fundamental that you understand that, that you have to have trust in yourself, you have to have trust in your orders, you have to have trust in your teammates, and you have to have trust in the system that you're gonna be utilizing when you go into that. What we find is with this advanced autonomy that we were talking about that is at the foundation of the human machine teaming ecosystem, we discover, and I've witnessed this throughout the good portion of my career, a shift and a transition from uh, the way that humans uh, interact inside the cockpit. We're watching human beings uh, shift from more traditional pilot type of tasks and into ones that are more battle management, uh, uh, battle management related. Um, as we do this, uh, it's important that we characterize the test and evaluation, the validation, verification, and accreditation aspects of what is necessary to realize these sorts of advanced aut autonomous systems. And when we do, that relies very heavily on predictive analytics like you, like you see here. All of that data that Stacy was talking about really does come off of these systems and so much of it is thrown away. We find that you know, every time we bend over to pick up a penny, $100 bills are falling out of our pockets because we're not utilizing that data and the data analytics necessary to determine whether there are improvements to the mission effectiveness of the overall system that we're talking about. Um, fundamentally, these sorts of things, the, the data analytics and the advanced autonomy are critical uh, to the validation and verification of these, these ones. Um, when it comes down to it, uh, as we find that we are transitioning our tools from just deterministic tools and into teammates, it's critical that we perform that training, not just on the humans, which is where a lot of these sorts of discussions tend to re uh, revolve around, but rather also um, on the autonomy itself. Uh, that evolution and that transition from tools to teammates is absolutely uh, critical. And this training really does apply to every member of that particular team. Whenever you think about a team, you, you rarely find yourself in a team, whether it is a human one or one that is paired with some other biological system or with a machine like this, you never have a team that is unilateral in the way that it communicates. It almost always bene benefits from uh, bilateral communications associated, associated with these sorts of things. And in order to communicate throughout this team, it's very important that you're able to share the information at all levels. And when I say at all levels, anyone who comes from this environment recognizes that whenever you see a chart like the one that Stacy put up at the very beginning that shows all of the different icons uh, and all of the uh, different vehicles on there, the first thing that most of us go to is that each one of those is its own security classification program. And each time that those, those things are asked to interact, we find ourselves with a challenge on the security side. How do we pass this information around, especially given that we know that the security infrastructure and the security system that we are working within is explicitly relies on a need to know as opposed to a responsibility to share? Um, all of these things really are required to co-evolve the tactics with the technology, which is uh, what Stacy and I have repeatedly talked about, both in our paper as well as in, in outside engagements. And that's an absolute uh, 
critical element to the human machine teaming ecosystem. When it comes down to it, we roll all of these things together and unless we are able to apply them to an actual operational vehicle, then we find that most of the, that exercise and that ecosystem fall on deaf ears and are not really able to be realized uh, in the real world. Um, part of the, the aspects of this, as, as Stacy mentioned in the overview, is this is important that we create uh, combat aerial vehicles that are uh, performant and trustworthy in the way that they execute their behaviors, and that's a fundamental aspect of what we're trying to do here. If you'll notice that oftentimes you'll hear people talk about live virtual constructed, uh, LVC is the term that a lot of people utilize. And I deliberately, whenever I talk about this particular subject, I deliberately invert the order. And part of the reason for that is that live virtual constructive really comes out of this uh, fundamental concept that the aircraft um, start in a training mode and that we move from that training mode into a, uh, a constructive one af only after the live pieces are being flown. That's a very training mentality to it and it is uh, intended to augment what we actually already have. In fact, the way that we do most of this research and in the human machine teaming ecosystem, we have an opportunity to invert that order. And in fact, we start with a constructive environment where we get a chance to look at all of these different opportunities. We stitch in the virtual pieces as human beings and as we gain confidence in that particular system. And only at the very end do we tie in the live pieces when we believe that the system is performant enough and trustworthy enough to be able to do that. And so as a result, I oftentimes talk about a constructive virtual and live um, system, not one uh, that is in the reciprocal order. Finally, you have to stitch this in with uh, current manned uh, aircraft in order to, cap to realize this particular capability, and that's where these human machine teaming uh, interfaces are really going to be found, are at that, that tactical edge where we find the, the battle manager or the pilots are essentially uh, operating within. So when it comes to the policies, uh, the uh, standards, management, and acquisition uh, practices associated with this, which is really the meat and potatoes behind what we're trying to convey. It's important, obviously we could go down a large list of, of different aspects of this particular program, and what we've chosen to do is highlight the three top elements in each, uh, in each of the, the categories that we discuss here. Um, the first is a challenge, and that challenge comes from the security establishment that I kind of already talked about uh, before. We find that our analog security system is really unable to keep up with the, today's digital uh, capabilities. And that is cause for a lot of concern for anyone who is uh, thinking about developing a new system. Fundamentally, what I've asked my teams in the past to consider is if they do see a new system coming down the, down the, the pipe, the qu ask it three questions. Will it, will it um, will it connect, will it share, and will it learn? If the answer is yes to any of those three, then we have a responsibility to share that supersedes the need to know that's traditionally associated with these security systems. Fundamentally, we find is that far too often we retract into the security architecture that we all came from, where we compartmentalize things and we restrict communication between these platforms. That is a massive risk and a huge challenge for this particular uh, human machine teaming ecosystem, but it's also an opportunity because it's simply the stroke of a pen to change that particular policy. And although we have some movement right now underway, we're a little ways out from that. When it comes to insights, we find the standards uh, is a great opportunity to see, realize that. The, the Rapid Capabilities Office has done a fantastic job of uh, realizing some of these open mission system standards. And when I was a DARP program, program manager at DARPA a few years back, I got a chance to really witness the capability of these particular, um, the, the capabilities of these sorts of uh, software democratization that comes from uh, breaking this vendor lock. And then when it comes to management acquisitions process, you'll notice that a lot of the, the recent development in co collaborative combat aircraft and the human machine teaming ecosystem is getting away from this concept of uh, requirements and into the idea of, of attributes. We want to try to uh, realize the unimagined vision that a technology affords us without being trapped in that law of diminishing returns that's associated with a hard requirement written many, many years before the system actually comes online. 
ultimately what we care is that how this, not just what the system was designed to do, but what it can do, and that's what allows us to do these sorts of things. And so, to kind of summarize things up, um, I would say we, we are on the precipice of a fantastic opportunity with the human machine teaming ecosystem. We recognize that, that this ecosystem is, is definitely fragile because we are at the nexus and a point in our acquisition development where we have to change. We can't continue to, to propagate the problems and the challenges that we encountered in so many of these other as, uh, aspects of program acquisition. We have to treat data as a weapon, like Stacy talked about. Like oil, we have to prioritize its extraction, refinement, and distribution accordingly, and not just make it an afterthought. We have to break this vendor lock and enable software democratization on these platforms, because that is a virtue of capitalism that we oftentimes eliminate when we vendor lock a solution with a single performer. And finally, we have to empower our future leaders to have the courage and the uh, ability to override and change the policy challenges and management uh, issues that have plagued us in the past. And with that, uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions, and we thank you for your time. No, that's okay. Um, yeah, naturally, uh, any time that you introduce a new system like this, um, the part of the testing, you know, one of the things that we oftentimes find is that in human, uh, human on the loop types of systems, we, we find that we point the finger at the human anytime something bad happens, but we oftentimes forget about how many times that human agency has actually solved a problem or or covered a gap that we find in an automated system. In, in cases like this, especially when the vehicle is, doesn't have the human being directly in control, you have to have these fail safes. You have to have these safety mechanisms in place that allow you to have the guards that are necessary to do this. If you look at uh, DOD Directive 3000.09, it covers, for those of you that aren't familiar, it is, uh, just was updated in January and it covers uh, autonomy as it applies to uh, weapon systems. And what you find is that we are very deliberately in America striving to make sure that there is a human on the loop at all times. When you do this testing and when you come to these fail safe opportunities, these are a great chance to prove the trustworthiness to yourself and your system. Like when I talked to my mother-in-law uh, at Thanksgiving, which I just did, and she asks what I do for a living as a test pilot. I say, my job is about trust. My job is about trying to create calibrated trust instead of blind faith in the systems that we have. And the way that you do that is precisely by uh, introducing these sorts of sandboxes with bounded expansion of the performance that we see. And almost all of these programs, whenever you start peeling underneath the hood, have these features. If you find a program that doesn't have these features, that's usually when the test pilot hairs in the back of your neck start going up because you start recognizing you're running with scissors in the proverbial sense, and you can find yourself scared uh, when the system doesn't behave the way that it, it's okay with cat pictures on the internet and on Facebook, it's not okay when there's lethal outcome uh, to the, the sorts of actions that are being asked for. Yeah, and that, that, so uh, that's exactly part of the reason for why we, why we wrote this paper, right, is to highlight that it's easy for the rhetoric to get behind uh, the, the, say, uh, positive nature of something like this human machine teaming ecosystem. But the problem is, is that we have some uh, 
say, incumbent processes and institutional inertia that is, is definitely at odds with what we know. The fact that 20 years ago we were having this same conversation. In fact, if you look at the 9-11 report, uh, you'll see that one of the things that was cited was a lack of an ability to share. And we thought, a lot of us that were kind of tracking that at the time, this is dating myself, right? Um, the, a lot of us that thought that that was going to provide that catalyst, that was going to be that piece. And there, there was presidential executive orders and all sorts of things that were designed to break down that, that, that stovepipe compartmented nature that is associated with so much of what we do, not just from the intelligence community, but also within the Title, title 10 side of things, right? On the Title 10 side, we have what are called special access programs. These special access programs are like oftentimes extremely compartmented, ro lowered into the number of people that can see it, and that is completely at odds. That's why I say our analog system is at odds with our digital capabilities and the way that our lives more and more connected is, is having challenges. So what are some, some of the things that there, there's a little bit of hope on the horizon, and that is tied to um, the SAP reform, special access program reform. Uh, I will say it is less than uh, what most of us had wanted. Uh, you know, you go from thousands to half of that, it still is thousands, uh, and that doesn't necessarily solve our problem, but it's at least a step in the right direction. For anyone who lived through the CUI stuff, that was a step in the wrong direction, in my opinion. Uh, so, just like anything, it's one step forward, two steps back sometimes, right? All right, if there are any additional questions, please find Stacy and Dan outside the room or on the exhibit floor in another session this week. If you have your ITSEC app on your mobile device, please go to the session, click the thumbs up in the upper right to rate the session and give us feedback. And if you're interested in presenting at ITSEC next year, please visit itsec.org for the submission timeline and process. With that, we thank Stacy and Dan for joining us today. You got them already, great, okay.